A bipartisan group of senators has reached an agreement on gun reforms. The agreement includes enhanced background checks for gun buyers under the age of 21, funding for states to help enact red flag laws, and funding for mental health and school safety resources. The agreement must now be written into legislation. CBS News' Skylar Henry has more. Senate lawmakers are putting pen to paper on a landmark bill to curb gun violence plaguing the country. I will put this bill on the floor as soon as possible, once the text of the final agreement is finalized, so the Senate can act quickly to make gun safety reform a reality. A bipartisan group of senators announced a framework agreement Sunday, which would provide financial support for states to create or administer red flag laws that would temporarily remove guns from individuals deemed to be a threat. This bill doesn't do everything, but it is substantial. It is significant. It will save lives. The deal also expands investments in mental health and school safety and enhances background checks for gun buyers under 21. At least 10 Senate Republicans have already signed on to the proposal, increasing the likelihood of it passing before the July 4th holiday recess. There's a lot of confidence that we can get this across the finish line, but obviously the devil will be in the details. On Monday, the Justice Department indicted an alleged gun trafficker in Texas and urged Congress to do its part. As our agents and prosecutors work to get crime guns out of our communities, we are also committed to doing everything we can to support the bipartisan gun safety negotiations that are taking place in Congress as we speak. President Biden has signaled he would sign the legislation if it reaches his desk, but would like to see more done. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Joining us now is Senator Debbie Stabenow from Michigan. She was part of that bipartisan group that reached an agreement on a framework for potential gun legislation. Senator, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate your time. So I understand that you negotiated some of the mental health aspects of this bill. Um, I'm interested in the incentives, particularly for states to implement red flag laws. Um, I'm wondering specifically, you know, who would be the person or entity determining whether to confiscate a weapon from someone deemed mentally unfit? Well. The dollars in this bill, there will be resources given to states, both that have red flag laws now and those that be, would be incentivized to do that, to develop their process with local entities. So it, you have to have due process. Someone has to be found uh, dangerous to themselves or others. And so there's already processes to do that locally through the courts. And so uh, this is given the states the resources to use the processes that they would normally do. And on the mental health component, um, what specifically in this framework, and I know it still has to be worked out into actual legislation, but from what you worked on regarding the mental health component, is there anything that would have prevented what we saw in Uvalde or in Buffalo? I mean, those are the two specific massacres that have really spurred the country into advocating for some kind of change sure. recently. Well, let me first say that on Uvalde, not the mental health provisions per se, but the comprehensive background checks for people under age 21, the, the pausing of being able to purchase until you do that background check check, the requirement that the police department needs to be notified if you have uh, purchased a gun, that would have made a difference. Imagine if the police department had been told that the 18-year-old had bought two automatic assault weapons and they had been put on notice and could follow up on that. So that certainly would help. Broadly on mental health, we're really doing several things here. We want to make sure that services are broadly available in the community and we also know that one while someone going in with an AR-15 and shooting children, obviously there's something wrong there in, in that they are completely unstable. But we also know that broadly that mental health and addiction is health care and we want to treat it like that. And we, we know that the majority of people um, that uh, need help and support are needing that in the community and they're not going to pick up an AR-15. And so we are uh, broadly creating co comprehensive behavioral health clinics that are fully funded, quality standards, 24 psychiatric uh, crisis 
facilities so that when the police officers are called to the scene instead of taking somebody to jail when what they need is service, they will now be able to take them to get service. We've done this in 10 states now as a demonstration project. The biggest supporters is law enforcement. So, and in schools, we need more. We need to be funding school-based health clinics. This is something that a uh, Republican colleague and I, uh, Senator Capito and I, have uh, gotten authorized to have school-based health clinics. We need to fund those and make sure that if there's a concern by a teacher in a classroom, that there's a social worker or a psychologist or someone else that can be able to follow up and, and be a part of trying to address this before something happens. Mm, certainly. Um, you know, interestingly, the National Alliance on Mental Illness says the vast majority of violence is actually not perpetuated by people with, with mental illness. Um, yet we hear time and again after these shootings, a lot of Republicans um, focus on that issue. Um, but I'm curious, in, in this framework, it, it, do you um, identify, you know, what kind of mental illness would potentially impact someone's ability to own a firearm? Has that been fleshed out in any way? Well, let me step back a second and say, for the one out of five Americans that will have a mental illness in their lifetime, uh, they're more likely to be a victim of a crime than cause a crime. However, it's also true that somebody who is uh, doing a mass shooting of children or shooting people up in front of a grocery store and so on has serious issues that need to be addressed, instability issues and so on. So we need to make sure that services are available for everyone in the community and treat it as a part of health care and support families that want to get their children help and, and broadly address mental health. But then we also need to be able to say, and this is where red flag laws come in, that if somebody is unstable and that family, friends, community, work, uh, workers around them believe that they are a danger to themselves or others, that people can take action to make sure they don't have a gun. And Senator, I mentioned that this is a framework. Uh, it still needs to be turned into an actual legislative text. Um, when could we expect that to happen? Can you give us some sort of timeline for when we could see an actual bill? We are working on it right now as we speak. Um, I've been very involved in the mental health provisions, helping to, to write the specifics, and we're, we're almost there on that. Uh, there's other provisions, certainly on the, the gun safety provisions and so on, that other colleagues are working on and, and other parts of the bill. So uh, we're working overtime to get it done as fast as possible. Hopefully, we're looking at just a, a couple of days or so. Oh, a couple of days. Okay. Um, and the hope still is to have something um, passed by the end of this working session before the July 4th recess? I think it's critical that we have something done before we leave town at the end of next week. I mean, every day counts with everything that we're talking about here. Every day counts. Uh, people across the country are saying enough is enough. We can't, we, we shouldn't have to live like this none of us and we need action we need action that we can get bipartisan support to do now and then we need to just keep working at it and before i let you go i mean of course any legislation related to guns has been so elusive on capitol hill so of course this would be a big deal if it does indeed uh, pass and and is signed into law but it, it does fall short of what a lot of advocates had hoped for especially a lot of democrats and president biden you know they had advocated for a ban on assault weapons um, implementing some sort of universal background checks, um, even raising the minimum age for purchasing a firearm. Is it safe to say that those items are just simply out of reach? Is this basically what, uh, what gun legislation will be for the foreseeable future? Well, I, first of all, I support all of those things you just mentioned. But governing in a democracy is the art of the possible, of bringing people together and doing the very best you can and then continuing to work. That's what happens. It's a step-by-step -step process. On these gun provisions, they are meaningful. They will save lives. Uh, should we do more? Yes, we should but they are meaningful. On the community mental health, the school-based health clinic support, the other things that relate to services in the community, this is huge. This is not a first step or a baby step. This is something I've been working on for years and is finally here, and we need to celebrate that. 
All right, Senator, thank you so much for your time, and we will wait to see the text uh, as it comes out, uh, but we appreciate uh, you sharing this information with us. Thank you. Absolutely, thanks.